Okay. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, most of the faces I recognize from previous uh, Zoom sessions, but welcome to some new uh, faces as well. And of course, uh, thank you, May, you for joining us. Um, I did read May's new book, uh, Burn, How Grit, Innovation, and a Dash of Good Luck Ignited a Multi-Million Dollar American Success Story, um, a riveting read. And um, I'm happy to announce that we will be auctioning, I mean, having a raffle, not auctioning, but having a <laughs> raffle at the end of the session. And there'll be three lucky winners of May's book. And I promise you, uh, you will enjoy it. Um, I'll say a little bit about May and then why we are particularly excited to have May with us today. Uh, May Yu is a Chinese American entrepreneur, author, and founder and CEO of three global companies Yeshi May, Glissly Living Home, and Chesapeake Bay Candles. Uh, May has successfully negotiated the sale of Chesapeake Bay Candle to Newell Brands in 2017 a conglomerate with a $14 billion portfolio of consumer goods. May is now focused on helping women-owned consumer product companies grow with an e-commerce platform to help women-owned brands to thrive. Um, if you haven't gone to yesshemay.com, I highly recommend it. I've already started checking it you know, on a regular basis. And I can see you've tried to create a kind of safe, clean, uh, supportive environment, uh, which to have retail therapy. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. One last um, comment before I start uh, interviewing May. Um, this summer, we are going to have a dynamic uh, internship program, and we're going to be hosting uh, two main events. One will be the Gen Z Global Forum 3, during which time we will address the question of how can companies in business uh, welcome back women and Asian Americans uh, by creating a more inclusive and diverse uh, environment. We want to know what their strategies are. We'd also like to advocate that they do this. So our uh, interns will be helping us with that. We will also be hosting a, uh, in conjunction with Asia Society and Shinocity, a summer um, arts gala we'll, where we will showcase uh, Chinese American artists um, and um, work with Asia Society um, and create something that's a little bit different. Um, our interns will be hosting Zoom sessions about issues um, related to Gen Z um, and how they're trying to overcome um, the impact of the pandemic. So as you can see, it will be an exciting summer. I get tired just thinking about it. Um, so um, now over to me, um, my first question as I was reading the book is, what made you decide to write um, Burn? What are you hoping readers will learn from your personal story? Um, I think when I stepped down in 2018 from the company that I founded uh, since 1994, uh, I was truly uh, hoping to take a break uh, from cutthroat business <laughs> that I run uh, because consumer business is very demanding, uh, working with large retailers such as Target and Amazon and Bed Bath & Beyond has its own uh, challenges on a daily basis. Um, for the first time now, we are hearing a lot about supply chain, and that was pretty much something we deal with uh, on a weekly basis. So I was glad to take a break. But at the same time, I had a chance to attend a lot of conferences, um, at which time I was sharing my entrepreneurial story. Um, I actually came to realize that unlike myself, many women-owned businesses are very small. And actually, um, minority-owned businesses in general in this country, I think the statistics for women is that only less than 5% of women-owned business can exceed a, a million dollar revenue each year. And I was wondering, uh, what was the reason that I could grow my business beyond a million in the second year and continually become uh, um, scalable through innovation and manufacturing and uh, partnerships, but where are some of the roadblocks for other women? Um, and then I was also trying to have a chapter two for my life. So combining these two uh, reasons, I started the idea of sharing my uh, journey. 
my husband, who is a professor of economics at Johns Hopkins, was extremely supportive. Uh, he said, don't think that because you're making candles, people won't be excited. Um, you're doing this also to share how you fail, not how you succeeded, but how you failed over and over. And so that other people can see that it's part of uh, growing up. So I have to say he was absolutely right. After my book uh, was finished last year uh, during the thick of pandemic, I do feel I came to see myself in a very different light. And there are definitely more things that I learned about my journey uh, that I can share with others, not just women, but other entrepreneurs or parents or educators, business leaders. Um, and I will, you know, as you and I talk about the book, we will focus on some of those lessons uh, in more depth, I hope. One of the things that really impressed me about the book, because you really clearly describe what life was like growing up in China, both the good and the bad, and I could understand how that influenced who you are today and what made you successful. Um, but what struck me was you had arrived in America in order to study to be a journalist, and then you ended up becoming a successful entrepreneur. How did you manage to pivot from one career to the other? <laughs> well, um, I actually arrived uh, at University of Maryland Journalism School to focus on mass communication. Uh, not necessarily journalism. Uh, mass communication and journalism was in the same school. And the reason I was very interested in pursuing a, a major in communication was because of my work for the World Bank back in China. I was fortunate enough when I was at college in Beijing to help them uh, during their mission uh, to interpret for uh, different mission chiefs and uh, World Bank leaders, as well as um, experts for different uh, industries. And in that process, I really enjoyed uh, being a bridge between the institution and the constituents in China. And I discovered there's a lot of um, conflicts as well as mismanaged uh, communication. And because I enjoyed working in such an international environment and I thrived, in that very diverse global uh, perspective, I thought advancing myself in mass communication would allow me to continually work for the World Bank and uh, serve um, at a higher uh, sort of level than just in interpreting for, for the experts. So when I graduated, it was 1992 and it was our war with um, Iraq. And as you know, the, the United States government is the major donor to the World Bank. Because of the war, we usually have to shrink some of our commitment during those years. And clearly I wasn't very fortunate. Um, I was not able to work for the bank because of that. And that's what propelled me to find the job in, um, in, um, in New York. Uh, it's not the best job as immigrants. Um, and someone that is relatively new, 1992 uh, was also a year with a, a, a small but a small and short uh, economic downfall, uh, economic uh, recession. So I found a job and I was there for a year, uh, commuting between DC and Mar uh, DC and New York. My ex-husband was in DC and I was in New York uh, working on this non-inspirational job. It was a lot of paper pushing. And that is when I, you know, discovered the opportunity to start a new business because I was not happy and satisfied with my job. So uh, my question is, because I could read from your history that you have always been resilient and kind of able to pivot. And that's one of your distinguished qualities. Um, do you think that, um, you can teach that to other people. Can you, um, can your experience be duplicated? Well, I think the idea of resilience or grit uh, has now been very much discussed, uh, not only in the educational environment, but also in business. Um, and I feel uh, it's a double-edged sword, but I, I can say the answer is yes. Um, I, I think that that sense of being able to fail and then 
looking at the positive side is probably something that uh, parents in particular, but also business leaders, managers should really uh, encourage. Oftentimes we like to praise people or announce the winners. It's very rare that we go and counsel the losers or try to sit down with them and say, look at the positive side. You could also do X, Y, Z. I think in Chinese culture, uh, as well as the US culture, we're very singular in winner takes all. Not only do they take the positive uh, attention, um, they also take a lot of, um, of that learning away from the losing side. So one of the things that I feel um, we started to appreciate more in this culture is how overemphasizing on success and over avoiding failure has created children that cannot be told no. You know, there is a book called Nurture Shock, which is basically nowadays, if the kids cross the street, we give them an award. You know, everybody get uh, some kind of a, a token of uh, um, um, just being showing up in the soccer game. While I feel that sense of encouraging everybody is a, a good direction, but on the other hand, I think we fail to recognize how some of the ways that we shelter and avoid talking about failure has deprived us of the ability to see the opposite side of success. The opposite sides of success is not just failure, it's also lessons, right? Um, and, and lessons sound so much better than failure, <laughs> doesn't it sound much better? And if you say what lessons you can learn uh, Tom or Alex, my, my son, it sounds a lot better than, oh, you lost. So I do feel for me, I'm very good at learning my lessons. And I always learn my lessons right after I fail. Um, you know, yesterday, or I can't remember which day, I had a conference this week almost daily. So now I can't remember what day was it. But one of those questions is, is about mentoring. And it's about how you advocate for yourself. And I said that, uh, to that audience as well as today. I feel when we lose, rather than really sinking in with the sense of loss and, and sadness, I think if you allow yourself to draw the lessons, not only do you feel empowered rather than powerless and, and passive, it is actually the best gift you can give yourself. Um, so I don't know how else to say it, but it's very hard. A lot of us don't have that um, positive energy sometimes. We just, you know, want to dwell on that. But I do find those in my organization or I work with that tend to look at failure as the beginning of a cycle of success because it's a lesson that is more important, tend to be, um, have more grit. I strongly agree with that sentiment, but I wonder, um, how can we um, bring this message to American corporations where like the bottom line is really, you know, the criteria of performance in a lot of cases. And if you make a mistake, uh, a worker may fear that they will um, be fired or not promoted. So it, you know, it's not an environment that really encourages people to fail. Well, that, well, I think the American business community, there, there are a few other reasons why I think it's hard. Um, one of the other reasons that is hard to me is about the way that companies, particularly public companies, have only one person or one group of people they're trying to be accountable for. That is called the shareholder, right? So when you have a very singular community that you are trying to cater to, the message is profit. The message is shareholder value. And I do feel we have seen the expansion of the group that they try to please. The social values has become a topic. And we're looking at the equity, the equality, the, 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 the sustainability and other things becoming uh, important. So I do feel as more and more companies, even public companies start to look at the, the KPIs uh, in a different lenses, there will be more chance for them to allow 
the managers looking at the entire population and find ways to see the positive light of um, uh, how to really evaluate success, not just in the dollars or this top line, but how much more diversity are we able to bring? How much more creativity do we bring to this year's uh, uh, you know, product launch? How much um, you know, sustainable we can make our operations those used to be not evaluated, right? And there are people who's very good at those nuggets of things that in the past, they are just not able to compete on sales volumes. Now they could shine because all of a sudden the organization could use their strength. I think you referred to it as the creative economy. Is that right? Is that what the term means in your yes. uh, book? Yes, so the creative economy to me is not, you know, about just the art, the movement of films or um, creating, uh, you know, big project that, uh, you know, they need a huge budget. A, a creative economy is the one that started with the concept of those people who use the creative output, such as writers, such as uh, tailors even, or fashion designers. For the most part, a lot of them work solo or they are working for huge organizations, but you know, in their own community, they haven't been connected. And when you talk about um, the creative economy, I also want to bring in the fact that a lot of the product that they design may not be made here, right? So they often feel very isolated because the fashion designers, you know, their fashion is made in China, in Bangladesh, in India. So many times they feel they're one of the only people doing uh, knit design or they're doing this design and they don't feel there is a huge community through which they can feel nurtured. So a creative economy is one that not only allow artists to live but also people who can create those artist pieces into a little bit more volume so that we start to create a, a, a culture where people that can make things with their hand with ceramics, with, um, with, I'm even saying, you know, why can't we innovate with mundane product? I innovated on candles. Can we innovate on a toothbrush? Can we innovate on everyday products so that it's more enjoyable? It's better. And then we can create an economy where a lot of people who don't want to go to college can go to a vocational school. They can learn to be a, a hairdryer, a hairdresser, design a hairdryer that can be built with more sustainability capable capability and enhance the economy where we're not just divided by those who want to do computer and those who don't. Um, so this is a very big idea in my view. Uh, when I see the, the government and the, the president is interested in creating manufacturing uh, to make our country competitive, I, I agree there's a competitive reason for doing that because of the PPEs, you know, how great it is we can manufacture the vaccination, the vaccines here so that more people can be vaccinated. But imagine if we don't have the chip shortages, right? If we can also um, manufacture more bullet trains, I understand that's a big problem because we haven't really managed to manufacture bullet train. It's starting in Siemens in Germany and now the Chinese are making it, the Japanese are making it and we have to buy from one of them. But what I'm not saying is that, let's not just stay in the manufacturing of technology items. Everyday mundane product needs more thought as well. And if we think about the potential to make those things better and less polluting, it's a creative economy that can make that happen. So that brings us to your uh, new venture, Yes She May. Um, other uh, women could have been excused to that you would take it easy and maybe, you know, <laughs> relax, but no, you have launched now a new um, platform. It looks wonderful. Tell us a little bit about that. So I am, um, you know, I started my journey at the floors of Bloomingdale's. Uh, I was like a bird out of a cage once I was um, shopping there in the 1990s. Imagine a young woman growing up in China without any luxury goods or beautiful merchandise. Going there for the first time was pretty um, amazing. And what I was able to 
to see it's the di different uh, movement in the fashion floors versus the cosmetic floor and then the home floor. So to me, shopping in those locations has always inspired a lot of uh, great ideas. But um, the pandemic is, uh, you know, it's not a small disruption. It's a major disruption. Many of you probably haven't been to a store like a Bloomingdale. And if you do go there, you find a very scantily merchandise because they have decided that we no longer need party dresses or high heels. And it's all very functional sweaters, sweatpants and, um, you know, sneakers. So the future of retail is really in question not in the way that you in New York would see, but in where I am in DC, where we don't have a lot of um, pedestrian shopping, the mall is really in trouble. Nobody wants to go inside a mall and shop for the reason of shopping because now we're used to shopping online. So um, when I started to write my book, I was also uh, connecting with a lot of women businesses. A lot of them are international and they were completely shut down because the, the smaller, women-owned store uh, companies usually sell to mom and pop stores. Those are corner stores that shows up in the, you know, in the main street or in a, a tourist spot. And those spots are all shut down. So I realized that one of the things I can do to help them is to provide a platform where we only open the business to women. And I apologize to Jeremy, who's listening here, that uh, I think there are a lot of opportunities for men's business in the future, but for now, we really want to elevate consumers' understanding of women-owned business for too long. People think about women-owned business as a cottage industry. You know, you make some greeting cards or you hand make some jewelries and you see them at art shows. And that's to the extent of our knowledge. In the case of our platform, you really see the breadth and the depth of their innovation and their talent. Most of all, they come from the culture where making those products is a heritage, right? So we go to Peru, we uh, found women that makes uh, beautiful sweaters from alpaca and there's no other places in the world that you can find such great amount of uh, skill set. And then we have product from uh, China, we have product from Korea whose beauty product is very well known. And um, we just love to showcase that because so often big stores, they only showcase the big brands, um, they need volume. So smaller companies under a million will never be able to be in front of you, to be honest with uh, everyone. Even if you want to find them, they are often kept away by the big retailers who arbitrarily say, we want to work with companies $10 million and more. So we find them and we want to make sure we can bring their expertise, their quality, the beautiful creation in a way that is very compelling. Uh, that doesn't seem to be a, you know, farmer's market product um, and really showcase to the younger generation in particular, who's also, uh, I find them to be more mission driven that you could spend your money with the women in which, in which case they can help their all, whole community. Um, so that is the idea behind Yeshime. Um, it has now over, we have worked with over a hundred women around uh, five continents uh, in 25 countries. Uh, the supply chain problem with the logistics uh, has not been easy. We're still working through them, but um, you know it's been a joy seeing how um, how happy they are and how our platform can really um, showcase the the way that the future of the creative economy can be because they are really connected with their community. You know, they sometimes they let people take product to make at home or. You know, they work together, they have um, seminars. And this is the way we also see that um, we use technology such as Shopify. Um, instead of having them to create their own website, we make it very easy for them because, you know, everything we, we do, they just upload uh, easily. Um, and they don't have to, you know, up, update all the time because our technology allows them to see all the need so it functioned, uh, you know, Leslie, you've been on it. It functioned like a, a pretty, you know, competitive uh, website. 
Um, what I like about it is also it's surprising, you know, because usually you go to a lot of these sites and you pretty much know what you're going to get or you are at a particular designer's site. So that's also fun. But this is uh, somehow it's just new. And so I really thought, oh, she really is onto something very interesting. Um, I'd like to now open up to the audience for discussion. Um, welcome all of your questions and uh, comments. While people um, are thinking about their questions, I have another question. What do you think we can do to convince companies to um, somehow break the mold of what was done in the past and um, change their structure so that women and Asian Americans can um, return to work and earn a living and support their families? So do you, um, do you mean in the way that they are more open to work from home or participate in a non-traditional office environment? You know, I'm open to all suggestions. I just know that a lot of companies are hiring diversity uh, experts now, and mm -hmm. I'm sure there'll be a lot of like sensitivity training and meetings, but I think it, it is actually, as you said, it's more a numbers uh, situation where you hire people and you give them the skills in order to be successful in their own ways. And I, I'm not sure that companies have like gotten to that point yet. What do you think? I do see the positive um, trend uh, before the pandemic already. Um, I agree with you. You know, I, I'm members of many organizations such as C200 is a women's um, CEO uh, sort of club where we routinely talk about diversity, particularly diversity on the board level or on the leadership level. Asian Americans um, challenge really came out uh, during the pandemic, as you can all, uh, you know, remembered how it started, how it really uh, transpired to be a, something much more than uh, just uh, calling the virus um, in a certain way. And it started to focus on not only this particular minority group, but how women and minority group uh, seem to be sort of not only silent, they're invisible. Um, I recently have uh, written an opinion piece for um, CNN, and that piece really speaks to Asian Americans' lack of representation. So the way I look at it, we have to address diversity and women's um, involvement at the very high level. Why? Because as you know, who's making decisions, right? If you're not represented in the board level, on the board level, on the leadership level, there will be very little chance that someone in that organization from outside, when you say an expert, I'm always very um, confused why we would add, you know, hire someone from outside instead of find someone of that particular race or that gender to say, you know what, you already know the business. And now I want you to take it to the next level. I want you to see from within our organization how and what we can do to improve and, and move the needles on those diversity uh, challenges. Without that kind of commitment, one person, in an organization cannot make a lot of change. It's gonna be very token. So I do want to see that if a company is serious about diversity, that they reflect it in their board, they reflect it in their leadership. And when that happens, I believe them. And I can tell you, if I'm in that position ever again as a CEO or you know, of a major corporation, I will absolutely want to I want my board and my leadership to reflect those we serve within the organization and outside. Why not? Because um, imagine, you know, we're doing business now a lot with Asia, right? And I find it very difficult to understand why companies that is a global organization don't have a lot of, don't have any Asians in their board or leadership. 
you know, when they go visit those countries, none of their leadership can understand inherently the cultural differences. And to me, that's a big loss because that is going to make so much more challenges in solving problems together. It's not just about language, it's really about logic and the way you make decisions and the way you compromise, and the way you arrive at a win-win. So I do feel this is a challenge, not only, you know, frankly, for organizations, it is even in the government, right? Uh, we, we always say, you know, what, what happens with a, a Democratic Party this time when we don't have Asian Americans on the, on, the minist- uh, on the cabinet level? It's a shame. Um, and I'm very much surprised about that. So I do feel that we have to ask for that at a very high level. Um, well put, thank you. And uh, we'll continue this conversation. Um, I do think that um, that willingness of uh, change uh, must come from the board level or from the executive suite. Um, otherwise, it's just really PR and it won't bring about change. Um, We have a question from Enid, um, basically asking, where do you find the women and the products that you showcase uh, on Yeshime? Do they come to you or do you reach out to them? That is a very good question. I can see you must be um, in the business because it's a very interesting question. So these are sort of over 25 years of experience um, traveling around the world. Uh, For my previous business, I do a lot of uh, trend shopping as well as working with a lot of vendors around the the world. There are definitely a lot of professional trade shows as well as uh, industry sort of conferences that I'm uh, joining in all the time. There are showrooms where some of these women's product are represented. So it's not a a wholesale level of you just get everybody and they arrive. Uh, It's it's cultivated uh, through those events. Um, Most of those events obviously are not live right now, but there has been some digital events as well as some uh, introductions. I find that most of the time when people come to us, their product may not be at a level that is ready for showcasing uh, um, Yeshime. A lot of them don't even have distribution in the US. Um, and because of all the cross-border uh, transaction challenges, they're really not ready to be international. A smaller company that only does wholesale before and has no consumer direct uh, business experience, it's, it's a very big challenge for them. So we, um, we tend to work for a little bit more established companies. Uh, in on this uh, level right now. Um, then the, another question is, um, do you pair women uh, with more experience with women who are just beginning um, as a form of business mentoring? We have not yet officially uh, done mentoring on Yeshime, but we do have a lot of resources for them. So we do uh, have Zoom events where we actually Uh, feature our own vendors so that they can hear how each other solve problems. Um, A lot of them, you know, have 25 years of experience or they may be sourcing from all over the world. For those who haven't started sourcing yet, those are good, um, you know, peer groups that allow them to share their experience and their learning. We do also partner with UPS and Square and uh, Shopify so that whenever there is a business update or best practices, we invite our um, uh, companies to join us and we will continue to do that. Um, One of the things I'm thinking about in the future, if I can do it, uh, is to have a vendor summit once a year where we invite those women to come to the US so that they can experience this market firsthand. A lot of them have never traveled overseas or see what a similar brick and mortar retail store would look like. And we also want to let them meet some of our customers because in my view, we need to create a, a, a space and a way so that the consumers can really see and connect with the founders. And through that communication, they can become supporters. Uh, I don't want our business to be a very transactional business, I do see the opportunity to cultivate that um, relationship more. 
Um, and it sounds like through this channel, you can increase friendship and understanding as well as commerce. So in a way, it's almost a diplomatic platform. Yes, yeah, it's very fun. You would know that it finally came back to my diplomatic background. I was trained at 12, uh, which is the reason why I was able to speak and study English at a very young age. And I never really get to practice diplomacy, but I do feel the spirit of uh, being a cultural ambassador has always been with me and I'm always fascinated. And I feel the customers who enjoy shopping at Yeshume is not only uh, someone that is um, going to champion women's business, but also they're travelers at heart and they have such an open heart and appreciation for other culture. And that's what's fun. So we do hope we can find more ways to connect with them. Um, do we have any other questions? Otherwise, uh, we can uh, move to our exciting raffle. Well, I was just going to say, I noticed another question, which I also wanted to ask was, that does May have a traditional office space with her current company? Or would you just start <laughs> as a digital and... Well, I'm so glad you are the only one of all my interviews that asked this question. So I have a big secret. Um, we have a relatively big house that, because we have four kids um, and we're fortunate during the pandemic, even my college um, son was back with us. Mm -hmm. Not only that, um, I started the business insisting that we have to be together with, with every members of the colleagues if they can. So we shut down in March of 2020 and then in the summer, we worked in different rooms, you know, someone's working in the library, someone's working in the living room of the house, I cook lunch for them. So it was wonderful. It was a little bubble. Uh, they mostly, um, you know, just interact with a very small group. And because we have done everything, we take photo shoot in the backyard. Uh, for a while, our models cannot be hired because they, they don't want to go out to work. So we use our own um, young people and myself as, as, as models. My sons, my two sons were models. Uh, I mean, we're, we're photographers. So it's a wonderful experience to really um, be able to see each other. Because we work with product, sometimes it's really uh, you know, great when samples come, my creative team and my merchant team can work together and decide what's the next um, landing page. We, we change our landing page every, every week. Uh, we are very, um, we're very fast moving. So we launch a brand almost every week. So there's a lot of assets that we need to create. I'm sure those of you in the business of digital assets know that it's not as easy as those young influencers just showing up and they're fabulously followed by the million of people. We don't have that luxury. So we have to create them day by day. Well, that sounds exciting. I also had a question about your first company. I was just down in Baltimore this past week and went to the Chesapeake Bay area and you know, it's so beautiful down there. How did you choose the name, et cetera? Well, I was living near Chesapeake Bay in Annapolis because of our factory. I mean, our company moved into Upper Marlboro, which is not far from uh, Annapolis. Mm -hmm. And I remember liking how, you know, it's just a very tranquil place. You know, it's not a, a Hampton or somewhere more famous and well-known. But to me, coming from China, that is a piece of, um, you know, land that is very nature inspired. And you see those sail sailboats on the weekend. And I just remember that feeling of wanting to invoke that uh, sense of peace and very quiet, calm, um, and that sense of um, elegance. You know, it's a very elegant place. Um, that is not a word that I use very often anymore, but I do find compared with the hustle and the bustle of million people <laughs> that I used to, I live in Hangzhou, which is a 9 million uh, people city, uh, not a small city anymore, and Beijing, which is almost 20 million. So you can imagine how quaint and peaceful uh, Chesapeake Bay really is. And I feel it just invoke that, that sense. Thank you. Well, I'm very happy for all your great questions. And <laughs> so now, Lisa, are you going to- Yeah, should we do the raffle? I put all the names and I will, I'll, I'll put on the view because we will reward people actually, you know, are here. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but thank you. That's a wonderful talk. So interesting. I can't wait to read the book. And so we're raffling off some of the books. So let's see what I have here today. Uh, Enid Cumin. Enid Cumin <laughs> won a book. Yeah, Enid. <laughs> thank you, Enid. And uh, we'll, we'll, I, we have your email information, of course, and we will send you a book. And I'm sure you'll love reading it. And we have here uh, Dana Robbins. Dana <laughs> Robbins won a book. And let's see here, I'm going to mix them up. And do we have Aaron Feingold? Aaron Feingold. I'm not seeing the names, all of them, but uh, I should take a better. Oh, yeah, Aaron, Aaron, you won a book as well. So we had three <laughs> books to raffle off. Um, thank you so much, May. And Erin, I see you're muted right now, but we'll send you, Burn, the yes. very informative, interesting memoir of May. And uh, you have your so email information. We'll, we'll reach out to the three winners and get your addresses and you can expect to get them on sometime next week. Um, <laughs> I know you'll really enjoy it. Um, so. Are there any other questions or comments before we call it a day? Um, so anyway, May, I want to, first of all, thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. And I know we will continue our conversation. We have so many exciting things going on this summer and we look to you, your experience and your thought leadership is really inspirational to us. So uh, hopefully this will just be the beginning of a friendship. Excellent. And thank you for your time. I know that this is a busy time. I'm between cocktail and uh, uh, after after work. So <laughs> thank you for showing up. I appreciate it. Have a, good, have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, everyone. Be well. Bye. Be well. Bye.